and plant breeding. And what's happened in transgenics in the last 15 years to me is fascinating when, of course, the things that have profited most up to now is the incorporation into, of, of a gene into soybeans that has a resistance to a broad spectrum herbicide. It's been widely adapted, uh, not only in the U.S., but in Brazil and many parts of the world. And uh, uh, one doesn't know where it's going to lead, but I'm a firm believer that the use of transgenic uh, uh, plant breeding in the future at the molecular level is going to give us other nutritional things like the golden rice, the high vitamin A, uh, but it's going to give us better drought resistance, varieties in many cases. Uh, just have to think what would happen in our own corn belt, where generally the high temperatures uh, with shortage of rain in late July and August uh, determines what the uh, maximum yields are going to be. But if you could plant, if you had two centigrade, degrees centigrade frost tolerance for corn in the corn belt, you could plant in April instead of uh, way late in May so that your flower would be passed, your seed would be set before you get to high temperature. There are all sorts of things that I think are coming by the proper use of biotechnology down the road. And uh, this is what's already happened. You can see that there's 80 million hectares of uh, land in uh, biotech uh, varieties. And it shows that, of course, the U.S. with 47 is by far the largest. Argentina second, and then comes Canada. And the crops that are most importantly modified by use of the uh, transgenic is soybeans, maize, in that order of importance in cotton, and then canola, the edible oil from mustard. 